Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, friends, welcome to another episode of Tommy Talk. My name is Juan. This is my chicken partner, Anthony. This is a judo podcast for judo players by two judo players. So, Anthony, how are you doing this week? You okay now? You got your rest? I got my rest. So it's, we, we, I did my first rondery in like a long time, like a hard rondery session in a long uh-huh. time. This Saturday, Hollywood Judo, we just, uh, for those who don't know, we used to do open mats, right? Yeah. And uh, attendance just kind of like, I guess people got busy. The window, I think with the reop- everything reopening around here, people just kind of stopped showing up. Um, mm-hmm. But this past Saturday, we just had like a huge class. And yeah, it was fun. Like doing doing that grappling again, is, uh, that level of intensity was fun. But uh, I'm really sore. <laughs> so I just slept <laughs> in, went home, did my laundry, cooked dinner, passed out. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, looking forward to keep doing that. And, um, that's good. We, we also had a lot of new beginners sign up, so that's always good. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm, I just hope this momentum keeps going as we're reopening and, uh, hopefully things will go back to normal. Well, yeah, you you know what? Everyone knows what I mean by going back to normal. (laughs) Right. So I was going to be able to train and practice. No problem. So Mm -hmm. at our dojo, what we do, if you're ever in the LA area or you live in the LA area, so Usually you have to look our check our Facebook and Instagram and stuff. That's when it gets updated the most. Uh, we do a free rondory. We call it open mat rondory. You come, we do one round Nawaza and then two or three rounds of Tachiwaza. One rondory. round and a three round stand up. Yeah. Yeah. And it's free to anybody to come. You just have to have a USA judo membership, a USJF or a, a USJA membership. Mm-hmm. Show us that uh, right now because of COVID stuff still. If you're a visitor, please bring your vaccination card or proof of vaccination. If you're someone that's unvaccinated, you have to show me proof of um, that you got tested recently, like this week, yeah, and that you have to make a test. That's a requirement that's by our the community center that we are part of. So it's not yeah. like something that we require, something that they want us to enforce. So. Well, also Tenry does Tenry does the same thing with their yeah, opening. Up, I, so. Yeah, I think almost every other dojo that's part of a community center does that so yeah so for us it's free open mat you come to rondori it's one hour to an hour and a half depending on how many people show up and how tired people get how hot it is too yeah yeah (laughs) hot is but again it's free and open free rondori so if you're in la area you want to come you want to try it out come on by we we invite you uh right now we're doing it at one o'clock uh we used to do it at two o'clock i think for the end of the till the end of the year we're going to do one o'clock and we're not sure if we're gonna have it next week. We're gonna talk about that later in the episode. But yep. so that's like kind of our, our other thing that's going on right now. Other thing that's happening with us is well, that me and Anthony, you're saying next week, but by the time this episode is out, it'll be like tomorrow. Basically. All right, so by the time this episode <laughs> comes out, it'll be tomorrow <laughs> in the future. <laughs> so yeah, actually that's a very good point. I'm not gonna tell you what day we're filming this today, yeah. but it'll be in the future when it comes out. Yeah. <laughs> So other news coming out to Tommy Talk is that we made some more short form videos on our YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did a lot before about the illegal moves in judo, like moves that are not allowed to be done. We did stuff about judo gis, double weaves, single mm-hmm. weaves, karate, taekwondo gis. What's the difference? What do they look like? Like visually difference, fabric difference, all that. Now we're doing another one about techniques you can do on your own. Um, so I did a call me bands. Yeah. Yeah. I did a whole series on my own uh, Instagram about things you can do on your own because people can work out with people. So we're doing another one for our own YouTube channel for the Tommy Talk about Uchikomi bands, uh, rubber bands, judo, uh, judo gis. Uh, I mean, I give it using a belt, yep. how to use a wall. And then an old school thing that I picked up from karate is actually just make it fill of the old army duffel bag full of shit inside of it <laughs> and throw that around. It's it's a great workout. I love it. it works fantastic for Ipon Sonagi. Yeah, you were sweating your, your ass off just oh, that recording like, that. Yeah. <laughs> when you get going with those things, like I brought the heavy one. It's funny in my you in my Instagram videos, I use my light bag, my smaller bag. But I was like, I'm gonna make it look like the big one. So I brought my big bag with me, and I just filled it with all these judo gears. Like, oh man, this is a lot heavier. Than my it, it was funny because uh, Gary Sensei came in uh, on Friday, and mm-hmm. he was like. 
oh, who cleaned up all those judo keys on the rack? It looks all nice and stuff. Because we have a rack that we have full of used and loner judo geese that over time just became a mess from people grabbing and trying on putting it back. But because Juan recorded that, he took all those geese and put it in his duffel bag for the video. When he's yeah, done, like, he, he put it all nice, nicely in stacks again. It was almost like three racks of geese. Just think about it, like I swear I put like at least... I want to say like 15 geese inside that bag, if not more. <laughs> and I'm talking about pants, gee tops. I think I stuffed a couple of belts in there too, just to make yeah, it more heavy for it myself. It was heavy. It was pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah, you should yeah. try it out sometime. <laughs> we have those videos that are coming out soon. We also, the recent one that we just put out was about Kazushi. And we've gotten a little uh, I wanna, bit of um I, I wanna re-record that one because after I, I after don't, yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying we got flack for it. It's just it's Anthony's opinion. I think Anthony has a very interesting opinion on it, so I wanted to share it with the world. It's the same with I have a very interesting opinion on the um eight points of judo. You know, most places, most dojos teach eight points. You think of it like if you're playing a video game, you know, it's your um your fighting stick, you know, how it goes around at eight points. That's why I think of a person in a body. And when you're moving around judo and I, that's my theory, but I do it to um, <laughs> how we do like uh, forward, backwards, uh, left, right, up, down, speed, sound, time of mass, uh, time and dimension. <laughs> I, I mean, I didn't make it up. It's all in books, like part, like a lot of those are actually extracted from the original copy of the canon of judo by Mifune. Mm-hmm. So yeah. this is stuff that you can actually find. And some of them might not be translated into English. Um, it might be in French, German, or Japanese. So, um, yeah, so like, I, I didn't, it's not like just some McDojo shit that I make up. I made up. So <laughs> no, this is, a, this is a real thing. You can look it up. We also, we're going to make a video about, um, God, I always joke around. I call it banana all the time. Uh, what's it called? Dab- Dabana. Dabana. I always call it yeah. banana. When I was, I was yeah. sometimes I just make fun of stuff and I just get that stuck <laughs> in my head. Like, you know, banana. What is one talking about? Banana. I'm talking well, about banana. <laughs> when I when I was learning Japanese, I, I did use phonetics like that to remember some words too. So <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um like, banana. Uh, yeah, banana. Oh, after, banana. <laughs> after, <laughs> yes. after after we released that video, I was kind of like, maybe we should record it because I kind of go all over the place. As you can tell from the podcast, sometimes I like jump all over the place and <laughs> I might be trying to fit too much information into a short amount of time. So I showed it to my wife and she mm-hmm. was like, yeah, other than the center of gravity part that you explained, like nothing else made sense to me. I was like, okay, maybe I should like re re explain that part. Cause um, <laughs> I feel like it, it was a little too unclear and maybe misinterpreted too. So that's like right. the worst thing. So I thought it was good. I thought it was decent. It was nice. Thanks Juan. But You're my number one fan. That's- <laughs> I'm your number one fan. Number one fan. <laughs> All right. And another thing that we have going on right now is one of our old instructors, Sensei Moss, created these really cool judo calendars uh, for Hollywood Judo Dojo. I would show them right now, but I tried on my green screen before and you, I just started ghosting out and you can't see what I'm doing. Uh, you, you barely see the like, little text and stuff. So if you want to see them, uh, they're up on Hollywood Judo Dojo's uh, Instagram. I think we put do we put any on our Instagram yet? I don't think so. I don't think it's on, on there. I think it's on my Instagram, but it's not on mm-hmm. Tatami Talks Instagram. All right. I will do that this week then. We'll yeah. put it on there. Let's do yeah. that. Uh, if you're interested in buying one, you can go to the Hollywood Judo Instagram and contact them on buying it. If uh, you're more of a Facebook person, you go to Hollywood Judo Dojo's Facebook and same thing. You can see pictures of the of the calendars there and on the Hollywood Judo Instagram. And um so for right now, what they're doing is that for non-dojo members, they're $20 each. So if you live in the LA area, come by during a class time, during one of our youth class, beginners classes, or adult classes, pick one up for 20 bucks. If you want to mail to you in the continental US, it's an extra five bucks for shipping and handling. And if you're outside the US, um, you have to let them know so that they figure out how much it costs because you know we don't want to lose too much money on these things. They're also... There, we're not making a huge profit off this. It's a donation to us, and it's going to go back to Sensei Moss as well for him making these calendars. For yeah, us. the the quality of the calendars. I was surprised at how high. Okay, I'm I'm not like trying to pedal for this, right? But it's <laughs> yes, actually it I was surprised at the quality of the the printing and the the paper quality. Mm-hmm. Like it's actually really high quality, and 
for me is getting at 15 bucks. I think that's the steal. So, um, really as nice a member, calendars. yeah. Um, I, I think the dimensions are eight by 10. I think the dimensions are it's so roughly. It's like, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a longer calendar and each month has a judo technique right there. So what I've been telling to my students when they buy one is that whatever month that is, that's your judo move of the month right there. Uchi, if it says Uchimata, or Uchimata that month. It's Kesu Katame, work Kesu Katame that month. You know, um, Ippon Sonagi, work Ippon Sonagi that month. Or the other joke I was making is that whatever your birthday month is, that's your birthday month throw. <laughs> I can't remember what mine was. Do you remember what yours was? Mine was Ko, uh, Kochigari, I think it was. All right. So next year, Kochigari, that's for him. <laughs> All right. Was there any other news you want to talk about? Any other stuff? Uh, no. Uh, we had to listen right. to a question, but we might just talk about it next episode. When we yeah, we, did, we had a great, now let's put it out there. Now we had a great listener's question. That I really want to get in deep about, and I think I might actually do a whole episode about this. So from Australia, if you know who you're, know who you are, I really loved your question a lot. And we're going to go, I, I, it's last night I tried doing some research on it already. And it's something mm-hmm. I have to dive in deep about, but I like it a lot. I really do like and it a lot. I'm, I'm totally not familiar with the topic, so I'm, I'd have to do some research myself, but Juan's more familiar about it. But yeah, I need to spend some time on it. And uh, uh, we're, I'm also at the same time researching something else that I told Juan about for our upcoming yeah. topic. So it's like, we have a lot of stuff in the pipeline, but it takes yeah, time. We don't want to just talk out of our ass, you know, so... We could just do we could. hot takes and then yeah. get people hating us and heating at us. It's like, oh, you guys said this. Yeah. Did I? Oh, I didn't yeah. know. <laughs> if you have any questions, want to fight us at all, have any run doors, come to Saturday run door at Hollywood Judo Dojo. You can find me and Anthony there usually. <laughs> so let's get to some interesting stuff. Okay. So this past Wednesday or last Wednesday, I think about this comes in the future. So yeah. I'm just going to do the date. So back on October 27th this year, Kayla Harrison uh, fought in the finals of the PFL's championship series, blah, 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 big name, blah, 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 uh, to fight for the women's lightweight championship. She fought, uh, what was the woman's name? Uh, Taylor Granados. Granado. Mm-hmm. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Gordardo, I think. Gordardo. Okay. So this year in the PFL, Tay- Kayla Harrison, she went um, 4 0. She, ha- she won two matches by submission two matches by TKO. Uh, the match that she had last week for the championship was the only match this year or her only fight this year to go to the second round. Uh, I'm telling you this because she won. <laughs> not gonna, we probably would talk about it if she lost anyways, but she won the fight. She had some great throws in the fight. So do you, do you want me to just go through the fight piece by piece or big piece? Uh, well, you want, I, I kind of like, what was I doing that day that I wasn't able to watch it? I, I was out, I was not home, but um. Yeah. So I'm going to give you guys a little short rundown of what yeah. happened. So the match starts. Taylor comes in aggressive, catches her right in the face. She's like across, right in, right in the mush, right in the middle of the face right there. Actually busted. I couldn't tell if it was her lip got busted or her nose got busted. But it was a little bit of blood. And Taylor and uh, Kayla Harrison was just like, mm I ain't doing this. Grabbed her. Just grabbed her. Was like, mm. And she said this actually in her win interview. She was like, when all us, all us fellas go back to grappling or do what you know. She says something like that. It's like, I ain't messing with all this striking. If I'm, if I'm rocked, I'm going to take you down. Tied up with her, caught her with a beautiful, it was old Chigati. It was really nice old Chigati. Took her down, ground and pounding guard, pass guard, some more ground and pound. The other girl, Taylor, uh, towards the end of the round, got back up, which is really good for her. Got back up. Taylor has grabbed her. And after the last like 30 seconds or like 20 seconds of the match, beat her with, through her with a beautiful Beautiful. You should watch it. Beautiful Harayagoshi. Beautiful Harayagoshi. Straight into Kesuke Tame. I, okay. the, the fence kind of broke her fall a little bit. I think <laughs> like if the fence wasn't there, it would have been even a harder fall. Yeah, it was this beautiful Harayagoshi straight into Kesuke Tame right there. And she's trying to get that, um, that arm bar. You put the arm over the thigh. She's working for that. Yeah. And the other girl's just like, mm, I ain't giving you my arm. No, I'm keeping this arm with me. I'm going to, ah, I know what you're going to do to me. <laughs> I know like the last, like I said, 30 seconds, 20 seconds of the round, mat, uh, round ends. So they go into round number two, okay? Round two. They come in tight again. Kayla Harrison puts her up against, I don't know if there, she was right up against the fence or near the fence, because I knew they were near it. But Taylor comes in with this cool Chigati. And it's one of those old school coach guys where she comes in, coach guy lifts up the leg, grabs it, 
is just like just she she only grabbed it for a second and then she let go. I think she was she realized she was already falling from Kochi. So yeah. she touched it for a second and let go. Yeah. It was still beautiful. Was just, she was already ready for that ankle pick. Yeah, she was already falling. It was beautiful. It was like just slipping a banana. Like they say, like yeah. a beautiful foot sweeps, just sweeping on just slipping a banana. Takes her down. Boom, boom, boom. More ground and pound. Passes guard. Gets on top of her. And, and Anthony was saying like, oh, they should have stopped that fight. The girl was like bent. Uh, <laughs> she was like belly down for a while, just taking shots in the head. And the rest just staring at her. Fight back. Fight back. It's funny because ah, you you watch the whole thing. Uh, I just like basically a couple hours ago, I watched the, I don't want to say highlights, but it was actually a longer, uh-huh. like, all the interesting parts, basically it was like mm-hmm. a 15 minute video. So, um, I was watching that part where she was like round and pounding her and I'm like, uh, are they just replaying the thing? So I actually had to <laughs> rewind and look at the clock. I'm like, no, uh, there's no way the ref let her ground and pound her for like 25, 30 seconds with no defense. Mm-hmm. She was just turtling up. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just insane. But she yeah, got out so, of it in the end. Well, she was on her belly she goes back to being on her back. Kayla's then on top now, Tatashi Ogatame. And she starts going for, I can't remember, she goes, I think she, she go for a Kimura first, I think. And then, yeah, like then, she, she out of it. Bro- then she broke out of the half guard, I think. Yeah. But yeah. in the end, she, she's on top mount, goes to the arm bar. As soon as she sits back, as soon as Kayla gets that arm straight, that other girl just tap, just, just immediately yep. was like, Mm-mm, I ain't fighting this. Have it, have it. You got it. You're a champion. All right. <laughs> So uh, Kayla Harrison wins her second PFL Women's Lightweight Championship. Uh, so now she's won two tournaments, the 2019 tournament. Last year, there was no tournament and then 2001 mm-hmm. tournament. As far as I know, also, this is her last fight on her PFL contract. So now she's open. Uh, PFL is also one of the only federations in the U.S. at least, unless she wants to go to Japan and fight Ryzen or something. <laughs> she wants to fight Gabby Garcia or something, Ryzen. <laughs> <laughs> um is one of the only federations or major federations in the U.S. that has a 55. The other two major ones, Bellator and UFC, only have 145, which yep. Kayla did do. She had a, um, I'm going to say exhibition, but she had like an outside match in, um, I can't remember if it was in Invicta or if it was in Bellator now. I can't remember. Hmm. But she did have an outside match last year at 145. And she said it wasn't that bad of a cut for, so she can't yeah. make it. So we'll see where she's going to go next. She's won $2 million out of, out of PFL. So that's great. Before for taxes. <laughs> and the good thing about PFL also is that they pay you per fight. But if you win the tournament, it's not like one of these things where yeah. well, if you win all your fights in the tournament, it equals a million dollars. No, no. You win all your fights, get paid for them and get a championship bonus of a million dollars. What What I really hate is like those, especially judo is kind of guilty of this uh, it's in, mm-hmm. in some ways bjj too it's like oh million dollar cash prize in the tournament but it's actually a million dollars spread out amongst all the competitors and <laughs> all the brackets so all you yeah, yeah. <laughs> first second and third divide a million dollars between them <laughs> well yeah well yeah you have to divide them between the each weight class each age division and then mm. by first, second, and third. So in the end, you probably walk away with like four thousand if you get two, three, four thousand. And uh, yeah, and then you still got taxes after that. So yeah. like then, going with like so, what two thousand, two fifty. Yeah. So so yeah, so she's a two-time Olympic gold medalist. She's a world champion, uh, two-time world champion MMA now. So let's see what's going to happen with her. Let's see where she goes. Other interesting thing that happened that same that same night was they had that um. That undefeated female boxer, also a two-time Olympic gold medalist. Um, oh, the Olympic Clarissa, boxer. Yeah, she's been pretty Clarissa big on Shields. Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Shields, right? Clarissa Shields. I think so. Of? All right. So I know she fought on the card. Bellator, Bell, I keep thinking Bellator. PFL signed her up to a big contract. And um, this is her second MMA fight. Mm-hmm. She went up against this Latino girl. This Latino girl, I can't remember what her name was, uh, but she was from Mexico. She's actually from my state. Orale. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> how do you score all the way? <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, okay. So they had their fight. Uh, she lost by decision. I watched, I watched that fight and it was mostly just using put up against the fence, taken down, didn't know how to get up, didn't know how to frame, didn't know how to shrimp out. Uh, her coach for that fight was, um, Jackson Winkle John. So uh, Jackson was actually there for us. That was actually interesting because you don't see Mike Jackson at a lot of fights yeah. anymore. 
you know? So him actually being there was actually- I always felt like he was just kind of running the operations now and has other people coach. Well, that's what I thought too. I thought it was Winkle John that was doing most of the, like, the coaching for the big fights, mm-hmm. but Jackson was actually there. And he, in my opinion, this is my, this is my opinion, I don't think he was giving her the best, uh, best advice. It was a lot of get up, get up, fight out of it, get up, not frame, uh, frame you, out, hold her. Yeah. You never know. Yeah. Like some athletes need different types of like some, some athletes no, just need saying. simple, I, simple advice and they don't, they I can't get process it. all that stuff. Yeah. I get it. That's what I'm saying. In my opinion, in my opinion, mm. for what, what high level coach he is, I would expect a little bit more from him. It's also, I'm wondering what they were doing because they knew that she was fighting this girl that was a more MMA fighter. Of mm-hmm. course, like, oh, if you're going up against a good boxer, what am I going to do? I'm going to shoot the double. I'm going to do a low single on you. And look what uh, Randy Couture did to James Tony. Super low ankle pick. <laughs> Chuck, I mean, Chuck, uh, Randy Couture pretty much crawled across the octagon to get to James Tony and just took his ankle. <laughs> it makes me wonder whether sometimes, because you know, all box, all fighters, tend to have a game plan with their coaches or the team in yeah. the corner, but when it doesn't work or the game plan falls apart, like what happens, you know, like, is that what, is that the kind of coaching you get or whether you just like fight, like do whatever you think at the time it works. Like, well, that, I kind of question that stuff when you do hear, when you just hear coaches say, strike harder, move. It's like, well, how, yeah. what is he going for? You know, or like, like I was saying, more, get more, up, kazoo, more get kazoo, kazoo. Up. More Kazushi. More Kazushi. What do you mean, more Kazushi? What Kazushi? <laughs> Pull him up. Push him down. What do you want from me? <laughs> but yeah, so that was another uh, two time Olympic gold medalist. She was an undefeated boxer. She holds three belts in three different weight class in boxing. So it's very interesting to see how she was going to adapt to MMA. Her first fight, I don't remember. I know she won. I didn't look up like how she won, but I remember she won that fight. Mm-hmm. Second one lost by decision. So, you know, just got to work in Nawaza. Yeah. Just got to get more Nawaza time, you know, and more, more wrestling, more Nawaza. Got to learn how to stop takedowns or throw or wrestle. Yeah. And, like if you, if you lo- look at uh, Kayla Harris's fight, for example, mm-hmm. you can tell the other girl knew jujitsu and she ha- had the good basis, but the, the skill gap is shown like she, she knows how to escape, but the, the, mm-hmm. by the time she escapes, Kayla's already transitioning to something else. And there's oh, yeah. always like a pressure. And that's, that's just like, why that's how there's levels, you know, like what's well, the thing that Kayla Harrison isn't just when he's a judo people, there's a thrower. I'm just, mm-hmm. a thrower. I'm just a judo thrower that get the stereotype that we all have yeah. that oh judo doesn't have good name. Waza. They don't know how to do anything. All they do is throw in some pins. No, she's a well-rounded judo player. Yep. Look at her Olympic matches. Look at her uh, international tournaments and matches. She had great niwaza, go straight into armbar. That's mm-hmm. something that made me a fan of Kayla, is that she's one of those players that would throw a person and doesn't throw and look at the ref. Oh, was that Ipon or was Adi? Did, did I win or lose? No, she would throw immediately in the pin, throw immediately in the arm bars, throw immediately into Nawaza stuff. That's really and, heavily influenced by Jimmy Pedro's style yeah. of coaching, I think. so. And that's how I think all players, that's kind of like how I teach my beginners, I don't want people to get that thing of looking to see if that's something. No, immediately go into Nawaza. The ref will tell you to stop. Mm -hmm. And if you don't stop and the ref tells you to stop, he will put his hands on you and tell you to stop. Okay. That's me. That's what made me a fan of hers. That's what I like about her style. When Um, I, when I trained uh, Wing Chun from my old uh, instructor, one of the mm -hmm. things that I learned from him that stuck to me was that, I mean, Wing Chun's a, a striking style, right? But, um, and this can be misinterpreted again, this, the saying, but he would t- always tell me uh-huh. hitting someone's easy, but controlling someone's hard. Mm-hmm. And I, that's not to say that hitting someone's actually easy, but you might tap someone easily. You might get lucky, but in grappling it's really hard to get lucky. Like you can't yeah. like, Oh, I somehow landed in an arm bar position or a rear naked choke. No, you have to work for that position versus in striking. You might get lucky and tap someone in the uh, jab, someone in the, oh, the just, face or, or the chest or something. Yeah. So you just start gunslinging, just start throwing hooks. You guys are in the pocket, just throwing and someone's in a hit, you know, who hits first. Yeah. And when you go against someone that's like s- that much better than you, it's just like a feeling of helplessness. Like they're making rounds around you and they can like, I don't know how to explain it. It's kind of, it's kind of like feeling that they can submit you whenever they want to. And mm. 
you just don't have control over your limbs basically. So it's, it's a really interesting feeling on the ground. Yeah. So my old high school wrestling coach say, there's mm-hmm. no greater feeling. This is going to sound horrible, <laughs> especially nowadays. So yeah. There's no greater feeling than controlling oh, no, no, no. the ground and knowing he can't fight back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's definitely some old school. What some old school people would say. That's not okay now. Yeah, but. because in wrestling we pin a guy. You know, there's if I pin you and you can't escape and you're fighting yeah. and you got the look of fear of God in your eyes, like I can't, I can't move. It's like it's like there's there is a control feeling right there. It's like yes, I hold him down. You know. I love submissions. I love chokes. I love heel hooks. I love arm bars. I love kimuras, Ude katamis, juju katamis. I love all that stuff. But there is something cool about holding someone down and they can't fight back. Yeah. I, I know that sounds horrible from, from me now. And I'm wearing my UFC thing too. Yeah, hold a man down and don't beat him up and beat him up the entire time. But yeah, so you know, it's just... The, so so go ahead, go ahead. Kiss katama and all that kind of stuff is just like pressure and pain and feeling of helplessness. Mm-hmm. But, at, but some like when I first... Before I even started judo, when I went to show up to a beginner's uh, jujitsu class many, many years ago, um, it feels like, you know, when when dads play with their babies and they like <laughs> hold their limbs and toss them up in the air and flip them around. It feels okay. like that. That's what it feels like. It feels like you can't control. They, they have control of your whole body and you just can't. They can do whatever the hell they want with you. That's that's what it feels like. And but then it's not rough. You know, it's not like there's not a crushing feeling or pressure or anything. It's just, you don't have control over your body. So uh, very weird, weird first experience for me, but uh, it is for most people. That's why I hate most yeah. people get really scared when they start doing the wads at first. Like I, yeah, I, had, a guy, I had a guy bite me. I think I told you, right. The guy bite a bit, the guy bit me on the hand. When you first started doing judo or no, when, when uh, I went to jujitsu, <laughs> a guy bit me in the hand when I got him, I took his back and uh-huh. I was starting to work on the choke and he just bit my hand. Like, uh, yeah, so. that does happen sometimes. The worst thing that I ever saw was one time I was teaching a beginner was one of the ladies that was beginner class. And it's like, it wasn't like when we had true beginners, it was like we're mixed. Like when we didn't have like beginner, beginner class, it was just, okay, we'll put the beginners aside over here and you work with them. Mm-hmm. I was having one of the women, uh, one of the ladies, doing some sort of Nawaza thing. And I was teaching her how to shrimp. And after a while, she was just kicking the guy off of her. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, after a while, I was like, she's really scared. Oh, don't you? I, I just saw in her eyes. Like she kind of like freaked out for a second. Yeah. So I had to stop and like, okay, stop, 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 stop. And I, I explained to her like what it was. And I like, so what is it that's frustrating you? Or what is it that's getting you scared about this? And she was just like, well, I've always just done women's self-defense. I've always, I've come from a striking arch before. I've never done grappling. This is really different for me. And I'm like, I was explaining to her, what's the difference between a kick, like kicking somebody yeah. off you and pushing somebody off with your legs. Yeah. You know, there's, there's a difference. Yep. I don't want you up kicking no one in the face and then <laughs> missing teeth or have a bloody nose. All right. Yep. But if you put your foot on it and push off their chest, push yep. off their legs, that's okay. You know, it's the whole thing of like, gra- there's no striking and grappling unless you're doing MMA or yeah. rules or something. But yeah, it's one of those just, it, when you first start, it's a really weird thing doing the waza for people and that they'll be okay with throwing. Throwing's okay. Falling's all right. But when it comes to the waza, just get that scaredness of someone on top of you. You have no space. Yeah. So that was Kayla Harris. All, that all came from Kayla Harris, <laughs> Kayla Harris her second yeah. championship. And we don't know where she's going to go. She might go to UFC, Bellator, who knows? I don't want to see her go to UFC. I actually do not. I think yeah. um, if she stays in PFL, hopefully it'll draw in more talent in PFL. Mm-hmm. And then there's a competition for UFC. Mm-hmm. The more competition, I think, the better. And hopefully it'll raise the, the, the wages of most fighters. Oh, yeah. And yeah. And going into with her training and stuff, her striking look decent. Like I'm not saying that she's like a world beater, like a world class kickboxer. But she had stri- her striking look clean, her yep. kicks looked okay and stuff. I think uh, she trains at American Top Team in Florida. Mm-hmm. I think doing a great job with her, training her, and getting her ready for her MMA. So she's been there for I want to say at least three, maybe four years mm-hmm. now training. So American Top Team, my hats off to you guys taking this world class grappler and helping her striking. Which usually what happens is that happens at American Kickboxing Academy. American yep. Kickboxing Academy will get these really good grapplers and turn them into world class kickboxers. Look what they did with Daniel Cormier, Khabib, um, Kane Velasquez, um, uh, what was the 85 champion? Rockhold, look mm-hmm. the Rockhold stuff. All of them came in as really strong grapplers and they left being really good, stri- really good strikers. 
look at Luke Rockwell. He got like amazing kicks. I don't think, I don't think Khabib had enough time to prove his striking other than the uh, Conor McGregor match when he dropped Conor. Everyone's like, Oh, that was the only time. His striking looked good. His striking looked looked good, but he needed, he needed more matches before his retirement to actually so could be here out there come to Hollywood Geo Dojo you can say Anthony there <laughs> <laughs> yeah but you, you get what I mean like that was the yeah. last time I remember him actually strike out striking someone right and so um out striking a, a striker before, it was the fight before he got his interim title shot I can't remember who he fought but he had really really good striking in that fight was it worse Poirier Poirier or was it Justin Gaethje? It was, it was, no, no, it was way before that. Cause it was before <laughs> he fought the, um, the New Yorker guy that was like, you boo me, you boo me. Oh, Do you remember him? What's oh, that? I know who you're talking about. He fights it, out of Matt Serrano. It's cause, Matt it's cause, it's cause uh, Tony Ferguson hurt his leg. Yeah. Yeah. That one, that one. It was like the fight before that his striking looked really good. But to me, even he has a really improved striking. American kickboxing Academy, Bay area all day, every day. <laughs> you can tell where I'm from. Uh, no, Al, so Al, Al, Al Quinta? Al yes, Quinta? Alec, yes, yes, yes. No, Al, Al yeah. is right though. After he fought Connor, he fought Dustin and Justin, and yeah. that was it. So yeah, yeah. I was right though. It was like he only had those two fights, and he didn't really uh, outstruck Dustin Poirier or Justin Gaethje. So I think he did really. I think he did really well with. He them. did all right, but he didn't outstrike them. So. Mm. Because you, you gotta, the whole thing you said was that they came in as grapplers and left as great strikers. And I said, good strikers. Okay. Okay. All right. So most of them left because, okay, DC may have not left as a great striker. He left as a good striker. Yeah. Cain Velasquez left as a good striker. Okay. As a really good kickboxer, mm-hmm. in my opinion. Okay. Luke Rockhold, I think, became a very good kickboxer. His kicks look amazing. I'm not a big fan of his, but he's a really good kickboxer, you know? And that's a crop right. That was like the last crop they have. Their new, their current crop. Even the guys they had right now that fought the other day on the UFC um, Abu Dhabi card. Mm-hmm. Those guys had very, much more in striking because they're bringing them over from Kazakhstan. Uh, not Kazakhstan. <laughs> bring them from Russia to AKA training with Javier, and they're improving striking. See, but. the the problem I have with that is think about. Having good striking as a side effect of being a threat of being a good grappler mm-hmm. is different than being a good striker because you're a good striker. Does it, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Like, no, no, it makes perfect. It's yes. that whole thing of, I know I have good grappling. So if it goes to the ground, I'm not worried. So yeah. So box, people, people are willing to take line. more risks, but if someone's like worried about getting um, shot down and taken down from you, mm-hmm. then they might be vulnerable to more angles of attacks of kicks and punches because they're always worried about getting taken down. So, mm-hmm. An example of someone that I think is a good striker would be Amanda Nunes, even though she has good grappling, but she never, ever had to rely on it. And people are afraid of her striking, not of her grappling. So I think that's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that's like an example of a good strike grappler. That's a good striker versus Mm -hmm. like Khabib. I think, for example, he landed that shot that took down Connor. Mm -hmm. That shot wasn't like an amazing jab or anything, but I think it's because it caught him off guard because one, Connor didn't expect it, and two, Connor was waiting for a takedown. Mm-hmm. So I don't. I think if he knew Khabib was gonna hit like that, he wouldn't let that happen. Or if Khabib mm-hmm. didn't have that level of takedown and relied on just that level of striking, he wouldn't get that far. So mm-hmm. that's just my opinion. Yeah. That's your opinion. So in other news of great judo players that went into MMA. Uh, Satoshi Ishii, everybody knows mm-hmm. him as the really good Olympic judo player. That's supposed to, he was supposed to go to MMA and just kill everybody. He was supposed to bring judo back on the map. And he had a salt and pepper, right? Actually, it was very pepperish. It, was very, it wasn't great at first. <laughs> and then he fought a lot of cans and some questionable matches. Like, I'm a fan of his. I'm like, mm, I don't think that was right. I think, that was, I think it was work. <laughs> so Ishii, after he fought Krokop, and this is going to sound really funny, uh, Tony Inoki opened up his own MMA slash pro wrestling federation. That's where mm-hmm. he had these some questionable fights. It's like, oh no, it's real. It's like, I don't know. Don't look that real to me. I love a pro wrestling. Fight. I know what looks a, fake. A lot of stuff in Japan are fake. Yeah. Yeah. So um Ishii fought uh Mirko Krokop, mm-hmm. lost to him twice, and then he went and go train with Krokop. He was like, I need to improve my striking. Mm-hmm. And 
he it's, moved it's, it. That's very humbling for you to go train with a guy who beat you twice, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. So it was, I think it was kind of like a, um, a give take. I teach yeah. judo and jujitsu here. You teach me how to kickbox, you know? Yeah. Since each has a, is yeah. like what a sixth on seventh on in judo yeah. and a black belt in BJJ. So Ishii actually moved to Croatia. He trains with Mirko Krokop instead of Krokop's gym. So Ishii's he's improved. His past few fights have been okay, but his striking has never been that high level. And he's one of those guys to me, in my opinion, always looks like he doesn't like getting hit. So he did something that really impressed me. But again, this is in Japan. Like he said, oh, um, some fights are works. And I don't know. Like, I, I hate thinking that. I really do. But it, it is, on. though. So Ishii went to K1. So mm. as some people might know, K1 kind of went under like almost 10 years ago now. Yeah. Like I think it was eight, nine years ago, it went under. So K1 had to sell off their heavyweight division, heavyweight library to Glory which used to be Showtime. It was Showtime kickboxing mixed with Glory, come together to create Glory kickboxing. When that happened, they sold some of the rights. They sold the heavyweight division rights to Glory. So K1 has been running just as K1 Max, which is a lightweight division. Uh, the past few years, they've been putting on not huge shows, but smaller shows, decent shows in Japan only. They're not doing like shows in Europe or America or South America like they used to. They were in Japan. So they signed Ishii to a deal. I don't know how many fight deal it is, but Ishii had his first true real kickboxing match, three, three minute round kickboxing match in um, K1. And he won. He won his mm. first kickboxing match in overtime rounds. This is one thing I do like about kickboxing. Glory started doing this is that if there's a draw in the three rounds, we go to sudden death. We have one extra round for all or nothing. Whoever wins that extra round wins the fight. He didn't look terrible. He didn't look amazing to me, but he actually looked like he could take a punch now which is mm -hmm. more interesting, which is to me is improvement. Because before when he would get hit, it was like, oh, oh, shoot, they're, they're hitting me. I'm on the floor. Yeah. Like, remember the fight with Fedor? Everyone thought that yep. was a work. And he's like, no, no, Fedor just hits that hard. I get Fedor hits hard. But if you ever watch that fight with Ishii versus Fedor at Ryzen, um, Ryzen New Year's Eve, like that fight, looked, it looked like he barely got touched. He's like, oh, no, I'm down. Oh, call me down. Yeah, like, <laughs> I feel like, people misunderstand a lot about taking hits. Like yeah. I've gotten hit in the face before I've gotten knocked out in Muay Thai and um, it's not so much the pain. And for me, it's not so much the pain. It's more like, you don't know what's happening. It's kind of like your first time taking a judo throw or first mm -hmm. time falling. Mm -hmm. You just don't know what's happening. Your body freaks out and you close your eyes and all, and you want to like avoid it. You have mm -hmm. to train your head, your brain to like, Except not to accept it and just like shake it off and continue and dodge and don't freak out. Mm -hmm. Same, same concept as judo. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think you can't really like, cause some people would be like, Oh, that guy's good chin. Like you can't really train a good chin. Like you get knocked out, you get knocked out. Like, <laughs> yeah, you get hit in the butt and you get hit somewhere that just, there's certain nerve clusters yeah. in your face and body where if you get hit, it's like extra painful. All right. So when you look at someone taking the punch, you should look at whether they flinch or they start hiding and, and freaking and go into their natural defensive posture. That's what you should be looking mm -hmm. for versus there are people who uh, take the punch and then they just shake it off and immediately go back into defensive mm -hmm. or counter or to prevent that pressure from coming in. Um, and then you also have people like that guy who was that Italian guy who fought, uh, fought, um, who's that clown looking guy? <laughs> the guy who <laughs> broke his leg. Broke his leg. Uh, Sean, o Sean O'Malley. Yeah. Oh, Sean O'Malley. Who's yeah, that, okay, who's that guy it. who I fought Sean O'Malley? And uh, he was just it? like. W wish uh, Conor McGregor. <laughs> no, he, he got asked to fill in last minute because the guy got injured. Yeah, so yeah. he fought Sean O'Malley and that guy just, he had a good chin, but he just basically got he zombied. Yeah, okay. He zombied it. That's not good striking. Yeah. Like, it's like, yeah, yeah, he could take the hits, but he was just like walking forward and like <laughs> taking the punches. Well, for more people that, that might watch more American stuff, more UFC stuff, think about is like, think about when Brock Lesnar fought Kane. Okay. Mm -hmm. When Brock Lesnar fought um, Alistair Overeem, when he got hit, Brock didn't be like, boom, oh, good shot. Let's go. Brock was like, oh, no, this is what it feels like. And he, would, like, he really turtled up. He's like, oh, my God, is this, is this what getting punched feels like by a real man? <laughs> Same pro wrestling. 
Yeah, so just but, being able to okay. being able to take a shot is not is not like the all encompassing thing. Basically, you, if you just take yeah. a shot and walk forward, you still can get destroyed if you don't know uh, how to follow follow up on it. So, oh yeah, yeah. But if you're interested in watching Ishii's first kickboxing match, you can find it on YouTube. It's very easy. Just look up uh, Satoshi Ishii K1. His his fight will come up on YouTube. Uh, he's had a second fight already booked. It's going to be in December. I wrote it down here somewhere. Uh, December 4th. It's going to be another K1 show in Osaka. So it's kind of interesting. K1's coming back. They're having heavyweight fights. Let's see if they can rise back to the top because right now, Glory's number one. Glory's one of the best fighting federations out there. It's the only one. If- <laughs> it's probably the only one that's global. I'm not well, a huge fan like- of their promotions. I watch some of their matches, but not all of them. I, I'm a big fan of Glory. I, I'm a huge uh, Rico Verhoeven fan. I think that kid's great. Uh, but it would be Glory would be number one. Then maybe number two would be um, well K one kind of since they have the hi- history mm-hmm. behind it. Yeah. One championship had puts on some good kickboxing. I, per- I prefer good. one over Glory. And it's yeah. very interesting because they one championship has just all these weird rules like oh we're fighting a ring today we're gonna fight in a cage today you're gonna use muay thai that's what makes it today. interesting that's what's interesting you're, you're gonna, about it you're gonna use muay thai gloves today oh no we're gonna use uh, mma gloves instead today it's like <laughs> is this a kickboxing match or a muay thai match like you have to watch and make sure which one it is and stuff trying to figure it out yeah that's why i think it's interesting to watch muay thai with small gloves because mm. people can't shell up anymore so it cha- really yeah. changes up the, the dynamics of it and more importantly muay thai with mma yeah, Muay Thai with MMA gloves in an MMA cage yep. is just like, this is nuts. <laughs> it is nuts. And um, <laughs> also the scoring, like if you watch like traditional, this is why like a lot of people, there's like people who are into the traditional Muay Thai, Muay mm-hmm. Thai, and then people try and change the scoring of Muay Thai to make it more attractive to the international audience. Because yeah. there's not a lot of boxing going on with traditional Muay Thai because kicks score you more points. So it's people would higher, always... Yeah. Yeah, they always go for kicks and knees and stuff like that. And while some there's some pretty nice bra- when you change the rules where punching scores more points than just kicks, mm. then or even a, a, around the same amount, you see some like really bloody exchanges going on. That's like amazing. Um, and they, main and reason I don't also have no, sorry. Okay, main reason ahead. I don't like Glory as much mm-hmm. is they don't it's just kickboxing in general. There's no elbows and they don't allow you to clinch really. Yeah. That's I you're love like, clinching like the one handed clinch and you're like, you have yeah. to hit immediately. Yeah. I, I don't, I think what clinching is like a huge part of Muay Thai that's underappreciated. Mm-hmm. So really think it should be allowed in kickboxing. Yeah. There's glory K one uh, There's K one, uh, one championship one. does it. Ryzen also does some Muay Thai matches and mm-hmm. kickboxing matches. And Bellator had a whole Ryzen uh, is one of those ones where I think is, uh, a little fixed. <laughs> a little fixed. <laughs> yeah. This guy's all hating on Ryzen here, man. Hey, I like but, Ryzen. And, it's uh, entertaining, but I think their fights are and, fixed. They look fixed. <laughs> and Bellator has their kickboxing division, which they really haven't done that much lately. So I don't even know if it's actually still there. Because I think they actually lost a few of their fighters to one championship, I think. Bellator I makes their stuff really hard to watch. Like, yeah. I, it, it's I mean, I, I don't. One one makes it e- super easy. That's why I like one. It's not just the rules, but because they make mm-hmm. it easy to watch. You can watch it on YouTube. You can watch it on um, their app and stuff. So you watch on their app. You can watch it on BR Live. You yeah. can watch it on YouTube usually the next day and stuff. So yeah. So that was the MMA and kickboxing judo portion of the show right there with some judo players going into striking, seeing how they're doing and how they're adapting. Another thing that's happening uh, here in Los Angeles, not here in Los Angeles, here in California is that we're going to have a judo tournament that's being that's being run by a grappling federation or a bjj federation they scra- they, how, how is this going they, they call themselves like they've run grappling tournaments for over 20 years they said mm-hmm. um it's called new way combat um but i've only seen their other jiu-jitsu uh promotions i'm sure jiu-jitsu is like the big money maker now that's why everyone's running it. that's why we know of, of them. course but um yeah they're they're actually hosting a judo fanatics judo championship and it's endorsed by USA judo and it'll have, it's going to happen in San Marcos, which is just a bit North of San Diego. So it's counts mm-hmm. San Diego. Um, there's some dojos out there I want to visit. So I'm going to check the schedule and see whether it works, but yeah, it's interesting. So they're, they're hosting a judo tournament that's not run by like a local 
like volunteer organization. <laughs> you know, like, it's not being held by a local Yudanshikan or local yeah. dojo. This is being held by a grappling organization, as far as I know. Now, yeah. we that was actually a very interesting thing right there. You're talking about that they mostly have BJJ or no gi or grappling tournaments, mm-hmm. and those can get expensive. Like those, can yeah. Be, so average cost a hundred something. How much this is this? One, how much is this judo tournament going to cost? Fifty dollars for all all well, divisions. Like usually in nor- judo, in judo that's tournaments, a it's judo like price right there. Yeah, and national <laughs> national what nationals are usually the most expensive, or a Presidents Cup. It's like eighty dollars, I think. Yeah, and then kids are usually cheaper, and but this is like all across the board fifty dollars. So, um, the thing is also this will be interesting because if this goes well, and I want to mm-hmm. see more tournaments run like this because they're using the software called Smooth Comp, okay. which I think Naga uses it. I know Grappling Industry uses it. All these other big jujitsu promotions, mm-hmm. and it's like an electronic software that does all the brackets and registering and it handles every tournament, everything tournament related. It's handled through mm-hmm. it. Um, but meanwhile, you know, like our judo tournaments, they're still using paper drawing brackets and pulling <laughs> in paper. So it takes her to do everything. Yeah. It's like, it's ridiculous. Like the other day I just saw, I'm not going to mention who, but there was on a Facebook group, they're advertising a tournament clinic mm-hmm. and they're like teaching you how to set up pools on, by, by paper and stuff. I'm like, why are you teaching these people? These, <laughs> why are you still doing this? Like why? <laughs> yeah. There is, this is a funny thing. There's software out there. We talked about this before. There's software out there to create tournaments and do everything easily for you, but they still prefer to do everything by paper. I don't know if they, they're scared about cost mm-hmm. or just a fear of technology like us at our dojo. We're changing our stuff from, from all paper system to doing stuff on um, the, the rail system. Yeah for our dojo. And even that with some of our older members is like pulling teeth. Like, well, I, I need 20 minutes to be taught how to do is like, it's really simple and easy. It's, it's just this, I'm not asking you to, to register people. I'm just asking you to take attendance on it. Okay. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And like, if someone drops out, it rearranges the bracket for you. It sets up all the mm-hmm. weight classes. It lets people, I think, I don't, I'm not sure about smooth comp, but some of them actually has an app or will send you an email when it's your turn. Like, Hey, mm-hmm. like you're about to go, like, get to the, this mat like yeah. to actually Five send you a notification to get to there yeah some of them have those features so it's like i don't know it's maybe it's worth it to charge more money um mm-hmm. but i think there's also there's also a lot of stuff to to put into account because i don't know how much it costs maybe they're trying to because i know some tournament a lot of people think we don't have judo tournaments now because of the pandemic and stuff like that but in reality, I think it's because a lot of people think we're not going to make the money back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, which goes back to what I'm saying, we need to increase the amount of people doing judo and not just run more tournaments. Cause you see a lot of people saying we need to help judo grow. Let's run more tournaments. It's like, okay, but you don't run tournaments cause you think people aren't going to sign up. And why do you, don't you think people are going <laughs> to sign up? Cause we don't have enough mm-hmm. judokas. So I'm not saying we shouldn't run tournaments, but that's not the only Let's go into the rant again, but that's, that's not the only thing that we should do. But um, yeah, it'll be well, interesting it to see what it goes, our, it goes in our normal rant of we need to advertise judo more. And I ain't asking you to advertise Hollywood judo. I'm asking you to advertise judo. All right. Yep. And it goes back to when, like Kayla Harrison, when she had her match this week, did USA judo buy a banner? Did USA judo buy anything? No, I only saw them buy stuff when Ronda Rousey was winning. As soon as Ronda Rousey was losing, they pulled out. They weren't advertising at UFC no more. They didn't have no banner. They have no floor thing, nothing. Kayla Harrison now is two-time PFL lightweight champion. Did they buy a banner? No. Did they buy any wall space on the- Well, they don't have thing? any money no. right now. Like if you- Okay, USJA, you can, USJF, all right? Yeah, well, they're supposed- th- This is when they actually pull out the grassroots judo card, right? We're, we're grassroots. <laughs> so we don't deal with yeah. that stuff. Yeah, so- yeah, It's too big for us. <laughs> but- the the yeah i don't want to step on any toes but this is endorsed by usa judo so mm-hmm. they're technically trying to get into the california local tournament market they like i think i feel like there's a as an outsider reading all the discussions and stuff and mm-hmm. their news post i feel like there's like an unspoken rule that usa judo only deals with international athletes mm-hmm. and olympics Mm-hmm. and the nationals and then the local tournaments should be usja and usjf mm-hmm. so here you're basically you can argue they're on 
Nanka's turf, right? But <laughs> okay, I've heard I've heard this before. Okay, I've heard this before, but I will say this. Um, God, I can't remember what dojo it is that runs this tournament, but every year the Golden State Open mm-hmm. is a USA Judo sanctioned tournament. It is a USA Judo tournament. You have to be. Uh, they have the USA Judo banners up there because that dojo, I believe, is a USA dojo. Is a USA Judo dojo, mm-hmm. not USJF or USJ. So that tournament. Every year, Golden State Open, that's out here in Southern California, usually, that one is a USA Judo tournament. So when people keep saying like, oh, well, they're never here, they're the whole tournament. There's one tournament in California a year, all right? There's one. It's actually one of my more favorite tournaments to go to also. But another thing about this that I think is very interesting is that the adults are going to have their weigh-ins from 11 to 12. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then we're going to compete shortly after that. Now, shortly you hear that. Hopefully it's in only, within only, an hour, I hope. Well, only possible because it's computerized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's one thing that we've always asked of local tournaments here is that why do adults have to come in at nine, eight, no, eight, nine, ten to weigh in, but then we don't fight till five o'clock in the afternoon, you know? Yep. And one thing I've always said also, and I've always had this, I've said this before, okay, if it's a four mat tournament, can we have two mats for the youth, one mat for the teens and one mat for the adults, please? Oh no, no, parents can't wait all day. We have to get all the kids out first. Why is it okay for the parents and the kids to leave early, but the adults and teens that want to compete still that are actually growing the sport, why do they have to wait all day? If I love judo so much and I want to go to a judo tournament, why do I have to wait all day? And I'm not asking for all the mats. I'm just asking if it's a four mat tournament, two mats for the youth, one for the teenagers and one for the adults. That's all I'm asking for. So what I like about this term is that they say shortly after weigh-ins. So I can go weigh in if I'm on waiter, I'm not worried. Go weigh in around 11.30, 11.45, hopefully. And then sometime by one o'clock, be fighting. That's what I hope. And when then I'm, back home by dinner. By tw- it'll be by really interesting dinner. if we can actually, maybe I'll try and see if I can get an interview with the 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 organizer, but. Okay. Fifty dollars. That's not the usual charge you charge for a jiu-jitsu tournament, and I'm really curious whether they're losing money on this. They have to be. Like they have to be losing on this, or USA Judo is subsidizing it. I think because, yeah. I mean, also this tournament they're hosting a jiu-jitsu tournament at the same time around oh. the same weekend, I think, or it might be the same okay. day. It might be the same time. So maybe they're only having one or two mats for judo and then they're fitting it as like a separate bracket inside a jujitsu tournament. You know what I mean? Let's just treat it as yeah, like yeah. its own weight class or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So maybe they're using this to test the waters or trying to see how it is and see it as an investment, even though they're not making money out of it. Mm-hmm. Potent- I'm not, that's my guess, but it kind of fits in the whole thing of like the mats are already there. You're sharing the mats at this point right yeah so that oh this it, it's kind of like if you were to share a space a judo school sharing a space with someone a jiu-jitsu school or something you can't bring up a good point because they usually just lay the mats on the hardwood or the linoleum <laughs> or tile whatever it says so if we're going to be doing throwing each other on jujitsu mats God, they're the same suck no they're the same I don't know. Some places have those. Uh, I, I've been to jujitsu tournaments. Most of them are the same. If you go to are the they? really okay. cheap ones, they that I've seen ones that use puzzle mats, like the really oh really cheap God. ones. They use. If I went to a tournament and they're using puzzle mats, I'd be like, <laughs> no, forget no. <laughs> it. I'm crazy. I ain't that crazy. No, I, if I was I've, in my twenties, maybe. Yeah, I've not seen, now. I've seen really small local tournaments, not in the U.S., use mm-hmm. uh, puzzle mats, but um, all the jujitsu tournaments I've seen, they use regular. Uh, Dalm or rollout mats or tatamis or something like the, they're the same as the ones that I see in, in local Nanka tournaments. So okay. I, that's because not I've something seen, I'm worried about. Because I've seen to save money, they don't they don't they don't need thick mats because they're doing they was the entire time on the mat. So they'll get like the quarter inch mats or the yeah, but they have they have the money. That's what I'm saying. So <laughs> <laughs> yes, they have the money. Are they going to spend it on judo? Yeah. Well, I'm saying like. They have the money and I know the mats are there. So I don't think it's a big mm-hmm. deal. I'm not worried about the mats, but be yeah. really interesting to see how many mats they dedicate to it and um, how well it's run. Because if it's run really well, I know a bunch of people that are interested in competing, but they stopped competing because they're tired, sick and tired of waiting around all day. Mm-hmm. So that'll be, that. that'll be cool. But well, one of, 
one of my other questions is that, mm-hmm. okay, so we're bringing up that they might lose money. Okay. Cause the $50 tournament, we know this system can get expensive. Do you think it's one of these things where it's going to start off cheap that the first few tournaments, I mean, the first few years is going to be a regular judo price where it's $50 for everybody. And then in two years, oh, it's going to go up to $70 or $75. And then in five years, it's a hundred dollar tournament. So it's been a long time since I took my business class to remember the terms, but mm-hmm. there's these things called price sensitivity. So you're trying to mm-hmm. find the spot, the sweet spot of what people are willing to pay while maximizing your revenue. Mm-hmm. Cause from a business point of view, from, from a judo point of view, the more people you sign up, the better, right? The more people yeah. you have competing, the better, but from a business point of view, if I can chart in extreme circumstances, if I can charge a thousand dollars for, um, sign up fee, mm-hmm. but only two people show up, then I just got $2,000 in revenue. Yeah. And if it's a great tournament, if I charge only $1, but I get a hundred people signing up, that's a hundred people, a hundred dollars. I, from a business point of view, I'd rather get two to two, those two people willing to pay $2,000, $1,000 each than signing up a hundred people that pays a dollar. So you're, you're trying to find the mm-hmm. sweet spot in between where you have, a good amount of people signing up while still making enough money. So, yeah. um, but to back up a little bit, you see how I'm jumping around <laughs> like kind of <laughs> when we're talking about the video in the beginning, yeah. um, to back up a little bit. When I say losing money, you can't think of it as a traditional sense. Cause they already invent they're running a jujitsu tournament, no matter what mm-hmm. the mats, again, the mats are there. People are there already. They're just having another bracket. So what it is, I mean, the, um, depending on whether they have volunteers, which is what they do in judo, or they hired people, you might just be paying, let's, let's say it's two mats and each mat has a referee. Let's say they have two referees that swap because it, it gets hired two referees and like two people at the table. So it's four people per t- mat. So let's just say two mats is eight people. So let's say you have eight people for the judo comp working for, let's say, extra three hours. So you do do the math. How much would you pay them multiplied by an extra th- three or four hours? And that's your actual cost that you're losing. You don't yeah. really have to count the the judo mat cost because it's already there. The mats are there. The venue's already rented out for BJJ. So that's the that's the way you see it, right? Mm-hmm. The, the fixed cost is not, is fixed no matter what. This variable, the, the other cost is what you're actually interested in. So... Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a very, very interesting experiment they're going to do. I hope that it works out. I hope that everybody gets to compete. I hope people aren't waiting mm-hmm. five, six hours. Like we normally do. I've, I've waited almost 10 hours before. I know you've waited like 12 hours before mm-hmm. you said before for a tournament. I hope this works out. I hope this builds the judo community larger. And this is more interesting to me because if we do do this tournament where it is BJJ, Nogi as well, and judo, it might get people mm-hmm. interested. Like, Oh, that, that that looks really cool. That throw looks awesome. Maybe I can add that to my repertoire. Maybe I can add that to my style where I can go to a judo club. And maybe that's even good advertisement because now you're having yeah. three different grappling styles there and that are all being shown off. And same for judo. Like, you know, I really like that submission right there. Maybe I should go to a BJJ class. I mean, I should go yep. to a Nogi class, you know? It, sound, it all sounds, sounds nice, but then you have some really insecure people that don't want to lose students to other schools or other styles. So, yeah. Um, but well, that's if you're something they should, that way. Then you have to worry about something that's inside. Yeah. It has to be way about your dojo or what's going on. But that's something they should consider. Like judo. Um, let's just say you don't want to pair with BJJ because of conflicts of interest, or you don't want to lose students. Then go rent a venue, a large venue with a karate school, like kata mm-hmm. tournaments or something. Like oh, yeah. re, just like you, you know the Nikkei games in yeah, um, the, one of the, the coolest yeah. tournaments of the year. Yeah, this like it was kendo, karate, both kata and um, uh, shiai karate, and judo tournaments all in one location. You're saving, mm-hmm. you're renting that big location, you're saving on 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 costs, mm-hmm. and you have large crowds watching and people. I was in, I was watching the kendo tournaments because I was curious how it works. Even though oh, yeah. kendo people, the kendo people smell like shit because they can't oh, wash their gear. They can't wash more, their more gear. Heat. <laughs> more heat for us. There has people with kendo sticks coming after us. Or so I, I, I got close. What you say about us? <laughs> I, no, I went up close to try and watch, and then I smelled their gear, and I just like backed oh, up. <laughs> <laughs> I backed up, and luckily Eat I'm your tall. Shit, like, man, come on, <laughs> get some no, lice off. Oh, 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 come that's on. what they do actually, but it only does so much. But um, yeah. So 
that's another way uh, idea like pair up with other martial arts tour- and hold like a, a martial arts tournament for everyone and save money that way mm-hmm. but the, i think it's great i think it's but great. i know there's some people don't want to share mats so <laughs> i think it's a very interesting experiment actually that would be a good question if they're gonna wash the mats because of the pandemic and stuff it's California. not the washing it's just like gonna- well what happens if you break our mats like are you lie are you going to replace that mat kind of thing? Like, <laughs> yeah because we're going to break the mat with the throw but my thing is like more cleansing that's going to wipe the mat down in, in between each match you know that's yeah. my question especially for the Nawaza people i mean the bjj they're gonna be on the ground the entire time mm-hmm. the no gi especially on the ground super us uh, slightly on the ground yeah so you we were going to talk about it saying like if you're going to show up to our dojo maybe not show up tomorrow well when this episode oh. goes out tomorrow because we might be at a tournament so yeah so uh, by the time this episode comes out, it will be Friday. The term will be that Saturday. Uh, we're trying to redo our Saturday runway classes, but because our sensei wants to take some people to the tournament, we might not have a Saturday run during next week. So if you want to come, it will be posted on either Facebook or Instagram. If we're going to do it at Hollywood judo, mm-hmm. Hollywood judo dojo on Instagram, Hollywood judo dojo on Facebook, but we're probably not going to have, I'm just going to say it now. We're probably not going to have open mat run during next week, but the week after that, we're definitely going to be open. <laughs> yep. But uh yeah, if I if I end up going, I'll probably talk about it next week, uh the next episode too, about mm-hmm. what my experience was. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna compete, but I'll be there watching and helping out. So um otherwise if I don't make it then it depends on how many people go. So if we have more people going, I'll go and help out. But otherwise yeah. Sensor Philippe's gonna be there. So yeah. Well, right now we have about three members from Hollywood Judo that might be going, that mm-hmm. are going. Three members that are going. Yep. So uh, it'll be right, awesome if they going. stream if they stream it and record it, just like in BJJ tournaments. How you could like, <laughs> they have some tournaments where a guy goes around recording or taking pictures of you, and you can pay uh-huh. the guy to have. It's kind of like you know you go to a theme park and you go on a ride, <laughs> and then afterwards there's a little booth because like, hey, you want you want to buy this picture? Like they have things what? at <laughs> BJJ <laughs> tournaments. Uh. Side story, years ago, I was at a, I can't remember if it was Pachanga, Moranga, had this huge MMA fight thing. And the place I was training at was going to go there, videotape the fights, mm-hmm. and then sell them later on you sell them later on YouTube, sell them later on eBay. Mm-hmm. So he put out his cards like, see your fight on blah, blah, blah. Catch your fight here, catch your fight there. He's got his cards. I don't know if he even sold it because we went there, we set up a, we set up a tripod yeah. and we just had the camera there catching all the fights. So it wasn't great because it was pretty far away too. So I was like, man, I want to buy my fight from this far away, but that's it is some, what it is. If, if the judo organizations need money, that's something they can invest in. I mean, well, so. here's something you can do, okay? <laughs> Get your phone out, live stream it on YouTube, okay? <laughs> no, I know there's some right, like, you can get sued for that. Like Flow Grappling, for example, with some of their events, Flow Grappling, sue mm-hmm. the crap and the um, DMCA copyright takedown a lot of people. Mm. Even their own matches, people can't share their own matches. So, <laughs> well, they do. There's one way to get around it, and it's very funny. So you take still frames, mm-hmm. but you take out like every other frame, so it looks choppy, but you can see what's going on. That's one way people get around doing stuff like that when they show certain fights. No, or what, hap- what happens is they look up, they look up people who have um, labeled their videos of that name tournament's name. Uh-huh. That's how they find it. So. Uh. Got to use some crazy little sub thing inside yeah. instead, you know. <laughs> Just be like, oh, look at this unnamed tournament I was fighting at. <laughs> like, oh yeah, Southern California tournament, uh, <laughs> not flow grappling. <laughs> <laughs> I swear to God, not flow grappling. <laughs> All, right. All right, yeah. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I'm that excited. Excited about that. So, all right, it's going to be a very interesting experience. I hope it does. I hope they do well. I hope this continues because it's going to grow the sport of judo and they just grow grappling more. I love that. Yeah. All right. So, please like, share, and subscribe to our. <laughs> so, please like, share, and subscribe <laughs> to us. You can subscribe to us on Tatami Talk on Instagram. You can Tatami Talk on YouTube. If you want to send us any messages, you can send at Tatami Talk on G, at Gmail. You can follow me at the Jerry underscore Juan on Instagram. You can follow Anthony at Anthony Throws on Instagram. Is there anything else I'm forgetting? No, you got it. You got it right. this time. <laughs> <laughs> this time, yeah. Oh, okay. So Anthony wants to end the show with a little special thing. So Anthony, oh. don't forget to slap. I think we were talking about how we need like a catchphrase, <laughs> like most um, clickbaity YouTube channels. And then we were doing the videos. I'm like, we should come up with like a catchphrase to end the show with. And I'm yeah. like, 
don't forget to slap is a good catchphrase. So no, we, we came up with don't forget to slap the mat. So this we're don't good so, again. Don't forget to slap the mat. Yeah. All right. So again, so right. Anthony, don't forget to slap the mat. <laughs> right, your roommate right. is called Matt too, so don't forget to slap your, the Matt that you have. Yeah. We're gonna slap in your, your friend life. named Matt. All right. <laughs> the next time, everybody, have a good weekend. Have a good Bye. time. Bye. <laughs>